gentleman will tell me once he has chosen an outfit. I'm sorry. I get Amirva Emri's Spice Merchant is a very important person, but the gentleman would love to have his own clothing. And not be forced to shave and be forced to wear... Honestly, whatever the hell these three are. Do any of these three really fit me? Like, almost... This one, the color is just icky. Would probably look horrible on me. This one is a bit more stylish, but has way too many buttons. Likewise, this one. It's... They all look... Ah... Okay, I'll, I'll be honest, this one looks a little bit more ornate and all the kind of stuff, so... It's st Question. Would the Emperor receive me like this? This might come as news to the gentleman. <laughs> but a towel wrapped around one's waist is not fitting attire for an audience. The gentleman will kindly dress. Well, honestly, this is just a Nordling tradition. Let's just say that. <laughs> oh boy. Okay, if I would truly... Have to choose, I guess, this one. Elegant Couture's doublet, Nilfgaardian trousers, and Nilfgaardian shoes. Alright, it doesn't exactly look better than what I had before, but uh, if I have to. And also, why does the bath towel have armor? With that armor being the exact same as the Nilfgaardian trousers. Like, sure, these trousers have no armor, but a bath towel with armor. I don't know what kind of stuff you put in that fabric, but oh dear god. Anyway, in the meantime, uh... There's stuff to... The gentleman would like to take his time and get used to the clothing and see if it fits. I need to figure out if it shaves or not. And for that very reason, I shall do what I would usually do. Uh, take a dumpling and a smoking pipe and all that kind of stuff. Can I leave in this direction too? No, obviously not. Okay, fine. Let's see what else we've got. A sword for witches. Because I'm curious. Who are the hunters, you ask? The folk like you and yours, I reply. The decent kind, haters of lies, doers of good. The kind who live according to the gods' laws and nature's laws too. Those disgusted by the ma machinations of witches, magickers and non-humans. All that separates us from common folk is that we've the courage to take up arms, to defend our land from evil, to slice out the gangrene that eats us from within. We haven't a leader, we haven't forts or land. Though God's fearing Radovid supports us with his gold at times, we have not sworn him nor any other ruler any oath. We serve only the eternal fire, and we listen only to our own consciousness. Who can join us? And who is right of soul and sound of body? You can find us in every larger city in the north. We will give you board, lodging and a weapon. We will explain how to spot the telltale signs of evil. Birthmarks and strange and arcane shapes, smooth skin on a matron aged more than 30 springs, and black cats kept in the yard, to name but a few. We will show you how to defend yourself from witchcraft, how to tame and snuff out magic elements with dimeridium. We will instruct you how to squeeze the sinner's darkest secrets out of them with a hot iron, and how to grant them cleansing death with the help of sacred fire. Honestly, is this... The entirety of the Order of the Eternal Flame. Because honestly, I don't like them. We had a friend with them in the past. But the entirety of them, it's like... No bloody thanks. Uh, anyway, no mish pranking. Interesting. Scrub the greasings from a dog's ear, soak into cotton twine, place in a new lamp of greenness hue, and set that lamp betwixt an eager crowd. Forsooth they all swear that a dog's hat they behold, and this shall be no sorcery, but good betidings. For the prince of Elander's nuptials, 
A paltry gnome armed with a miniature cutlass behit himself in the pie. When Gaspar took off the princely banquets, Anon jumped out the besabered gnome, given a terrible fright to all at first, then causing much merriment once a jest was figured. A Cynocephalus, or a doghead in our tongue, a beast that in the waves of Zangabar dwells, has the corpse of a man but the head of a dog. The Prince of Elander did receive such a specimen from those far off lands. The Cynocephalus let stream its urine with the toiling of every hour, both day and night. And this is why the Zangibarians engrave his likeness on timepiece and compasses. I'm sorry, what? I barely understood a word of any of that, but... I guess those be gnomish prankings. Uh, Vedimi, directly out of Nordling Tales. Inconceivable. Are you talking about me, honestly? Is that what you mean? Because you shaved me? Again, thank you for that because of the lies apparently, but... Yeah... Anyway, the opposition in Nilfgaard. Oh, I'd like to know about that one. While Nilfgaard's emperor wields absolute power, harshly crushing the slightest sign of disobedience, opposing forces continue to exist within the empire. For this I do not mean the disgruntled leaders of conquered provinces, but the magnates within the city of a thousand towers who are unhappy with the current leadership. This conflict between the emperor and the noble houses of Nilfgaard, the capital, dates back many years. All the princes of the blood and magnates expected their rulers to wed one of their daughters and sire an heir with one of their own. The emperor, however, had other plans. This proved a slap in the face for all the great families from which he refused to take a bride. The Nilfgaardian opposition patiently waits for the emperor to slip up, for some event to occur which will weaken his authority, be it an economic crisis or a defeat in battle. A secret conspiracy lies ready to seize such a moment to incite the disaffected, assassinate the emperor and carry out a coup d'etat, culminating with one of their own numbers ascending to the throne. For obvious reasons, only a limited few know of this conspiracy, but any shrewd observer of Nilfgaardian policies can read the science of its workings. So long as men are men and the world is as it is, certain dynamics will forever remain the same, and the discontented will always form subversive societies with their secret signs and hidden agendas. Well, that's the whole thing with the whole rulership and all that kind of stuff. You're always dealing with politics, and honestly, politics just suck. A shame I have no time. A shame the gentleman does not have the words to properly reply to that. You hide bear hide inside of that? Honestly, and you call me a barbarian. Anyway, uh, nearly done. The Chronicles of Redania. Vridang the Elf. Despite what one might conclude from his moniker, not one drop of elven blood flowed in King Vridang's veins. They called him the Elf because of his exceptional beauty and for the great admiration he felt for the Anshe. This fascination, seemingly harmless, would have horrible long-term consequences. King Vridank, spitting in the face of all laws and customs, chose as his wife a half-elf, and one of low status at that, known as Beatrix of Kovir. The fruit of this regrettable and short-lived misalience was Falca, who later formed, fomented bloody revolt against her own father. Though this uprising was ultimately extinguished and Falca herself burned at the stake, the young state was thereafter thrown into chaos for years to come. Well, Redania, Kovia, whatever. Directly out of you just said that. Meanwhile, a mug, brilliant. The wonders of Zerikania. During my many travels I have seen countless extraordinary places. The primeval wilds of Brokilon, with trees so high their tips disappear in the clouds. Dwarven chambers carved into the guts of the Mahaka Mountains, with walls plated in pure gold. The ice palace of Pont Vanis, adorned with stained frost windows. Yet none of these made such an impression on me as did the rightly famed Zerikania. Yet while I was traversing the fiery mountains, I feared disappointment awaited me on the other side. I had heard many a fantastic tale about Zerikania, about his trackless sands burned white by the sun, his golden-scaled dragons weaving their nests amidst the dunes, 
Its hunchbacked horse able to survive weeks without even a swallow of water. Yet none seemed to me at all plausible. But I was sure all these sensations were but the figment of some bard's overactive imagination. I know this will be hard for you. I know this will be as hard for you to believe, dear reader, as it once was for me. But all the unbelievable tales are true. Not only that, during my many months of travel I came across wonders far surpassing those any prior travelogues mentioned. I saw temples dedicated to the worship of dragons. I heard the f their voice, almost human, but reverberating with a thousand echoes. I met warrior maids clad in leopard skins, tattooed from head to foot and given no ground to witches in mastery of the blade. I saw mages who channeled power from fire. I saw seemingly harmless flies whose solitary bite would make a man fall into a deep slumber, never to awaken, safe to die. In short, Saracania is a land where the fantastic is normal and the impossible occurs daily. I do wonder if we will ever go to Saracania. Like maybe in the future. Have we been there in the past? Shame I, have no I know you have no time, I'm aware. Uh, anyway, um, Mr. Chamberlain, Mr. Peasants, I think these clothes will suffice. Black suits the gentleman. I have no other choice. The gentleman? Not really, but it will have to do, I guess. A studded doublet and a sword on my back, that's what would satisfy me. But tough, when in Nilfgaard. Yes. It's a saying. So what now? Powder my nose? No need. The gentleman's complexion is light enough. That was the humor. is to stand before the ruler of the north and south. I must confirm that he knows how to bow. I'm sorry? Like, okay, I'm teetering on the edge of being rebellious, and also, we're about to meet the Emperor of Nilfgaard, who we might want to keep on our good side. Someone who we've apparently met in the past? It's. Ah, fine. Confirm away. Confirm away. Please watch. Leg extended, hand flat, head down, chin to chest. The gentleman will rehearse. Um. Okay, uh, right leg forward, left hand on chest. No, you did the right hand on the chest. I mean, I, honestly, it is absurd, but on the other hand, oh, let's just play nice. Hmm, lacking fluidity and grace. But we've learned to expect less of Nordlings. Come with me. Yeah. Still not liking this. The gentleman will address the Emperor only when asked to, and using the appropriate type. Your Arch Magnificency. <laughs> I see the gentleman is in the mood for jest. Yes, I am. I fear the Emperor might not share his disposition. Your majesty will suffice. Spoken loudly, clearly, and with respect. The gentleman named Geralt of Rivia, Butcher of Blaviken, understands. In Grimmi et Art Kerzer, Dyfen Aden in Karn et Narvut, Emir Var Emreis. Bow. Uh, you know what's fine. Let's show that we're here to play nice. Trying to. Your Imperial Majesty. Arer ep do orde. Avelian namen vat gun favot. I seriously look ridiculous in this outfit. I thought you bowed before no man. Didn't want to disappoint the Chamberlain. 
We're friends. He seemed very keen on me doing the right thing. Take it you didn't summon me to reminisce about the good old days, so... Silence. My daughter, Cyrilla. She's returned. Wait, she... And she's she's your danger. daughter. The wild hunt pursues her. You will find her and bring her to me. Wait, she's back. You're sure? Are you sure? Siri left. Went far, far away. Where to? Do you believe I drag you here in the middle of a war to discuss a rumor? I think anyone can be wrong, even an emperor. I had forgotten how insolent you can be. I haven't the time to convince you, nor the desire, in fact. Yennefer will do that after the audience. That explains why Yennefer accepted as well. Okay, but why me? How many men in your army? 20,000? 30? So why me? You know why. Because she trusts you. She trusts me, yes. So tell me why you're looking for her. Doubt it's about making up for all those lost years. For reasons of state, as always. Enough of this banter. You will agree regardless. If for no other reason than because I shall pay you. More than you customarily receive for a contract. Considerably more. Hmm. Personally, need information, not motivation. Uh, no, I'm only doing this for Siri, to be honest. And dear God, does she, does she look miserable in that outfit? It's good that she came to us in the end. Save your generosity for those whose homes your armies have raised. I'll do it for Siri, not for your gold. Your motives do not interest me, only results. Yennefer will tell you the rest. This audience is finished. Meredith! Take him to the sorceress. I don't like this emperor. No, I don't. Follow me, if the gentleman pleases. Please keep close. There are many honorable guests in the palace whom the gentleman disgusts. Need not bother. <laughs> what if I do want to bother? Uh, anyway. This, the Palace of Azima. Uh, it feels weird to see it without its Temerian colors. Because that is where we saw King Fultest for the very first time. I remember this room. Uh, now they're removing the lilies. I think they are. Okay. Sorry, I'm here, I'm here. Yes. Yes, that'd be me. That'd be me. Uh, sorry, I'm. There's so many people talking in different languages, and I'm like, what are they saying? Okay, uh, whatever you say is probably the truth. Uh, where's... I'm sorry, the gentleman didn't notice where you were going. Oh God. Yeah, I miss my home too. Uh. I do want to... Do we get to explore the rest of the scene as well? Oh, yes, please. Yes, please. I want my possessions back. But for now? Yes. Then transcribe. The true authority in Novigrad is not the city council or the merchant's guild, but the church of the eternal fire and the criminal underworld. At times, it is difficult to tell the one from the other. They both display a similar ruthlessness and cynicism that... Please wait, Your Excellency. I'm falling behind. You know what? I'll write the report myself. You'll need only prepare a clean draft. In triplicate. 
You should invent a press of some kind. Could help. Meanwhile, where is Jennifer? Geralt, that tunic. You look positively smashing. Yeah, thank you. Ugh, dying to take it off. I'd consider that a proposition under different circumstances. One I might even take you up on. But we've matters to attend to. Now do you understand why I'm at Amir's court? Yes, I do. Oh, and seems we're in the same boat now. Siri, she's really back? No chance he's mistaken? Look, that's more or less what she looks like now. Or so our agents claim. Our little witch has grown into a young lady. Hmm. All grown up. How long has it been since we've seen her? How about that? She's grown up. It's been years since you trained together at Kaer Morhen. A great deal has changed. You haven't. Not a bit. I missed those awkward compliments of yours. But let's focus on Ciri, all right? Right. Amir said the wild hunts after her. I'd find that hard to believe before what happened yesterday. How did they track us down? Because of me. You see, I've spent months searching for Siri, using locating spells, haruspicy, geomancy, anything, really. I knew the Wild Hunt might sense it, perhaps even find me, but I thought I'd trick them. Yep, more powerful well, than we thought. I guess you were wrong. Hmm. I've sensed them on my trail, hunting me for some time. If not for you and Amir's soldiers, they'd have gotten what they were after. I can't risk another encounter like that. It's time to put away the magic, turn to more traditional methods. To the best tracker I know. You must find her, Geralt, before the Wild Hunt does. But what do they want from her, honestly? The Wild Hunt? What could it want from Ciri? I've no clue, Geralt. Might have written them to ask, but I don't have their address. Yeah, I get it. I know as much as you do. It must be about her blood. Her gift. As for what the hunt wishes to do with that gift, I... I prefer not to think about it, really. Can't be any good, that's for sure. So, the rumor. Or, not the rumor. Where has she been seen? So where has Ciri been seen, exactly? In two places. Velen and Novigrad. The trail in Velen is most promising. You should make that your first stop. Ask for a merchant named Hendrik at the inn at the crossroads. One of the Emperor's agents. He should get in touch with you. That's it? No passwords? Secret handshakes? None. Sorry to spoil your fun. Your boyhood fantasies about the crafts of the trade. All we have in Novigrad are unconformed reports, rumors. But there you will have the help of our mutual acquaintance. Triss Merigold. Apparently she's got a cozy flat on the main square. Sure she'll be delighted to see me. What about you? What will you do? I shall sail for Skellige. There was a magic explosion there recently, blew half a forest down. Whoa. I believe this had something to do with Ciri. I'll be in care trolled. Join me there once you've learned something. Uh, okay, but before we part, why didn't you contact me earlier? Like, okay. Uh, Letho told me that you fell in Nilfgaardian hands, but that was quite some time ago right now. You regained your memory at some point too, why didn't you contact me earlier? I've been looking for you all over, and I've been running around without memory for a long time as well. One thing before we go, why didn't you contact me? Didn't need me? Didn't even want to see me? I didn't want to spoil things. I'd heard you and Triss made a great couple. Yeah, about that. And I'd lost my memory. Really? That's your excuse? That's a good excuse. Let's drop it, alright? It's not what you think, or it helped me understand how much I love you. I don't wish to hear it. Any of it. Okay, fine. 
Yeah, this is kind of what I feared. Stuff is complicated. Well, Velen, you said? Then I guess it's time to get going. Guess this means we need to split up again. Not my preference, but I understand. Clock's ticking. It is indeed. So why don't I teleport you to Velen, get you there at once? Not yet. Not gonna happen. I'll go on horseback, as soon as I can get changed. Have it your way? Oh, and you really look quite dashing in black velvet. Think so? Maybe I can have some of my armor lined with it. <laughs> Good luck, Yen. Same to you. And if you wish to learn what's happened in the world while you and Vesemir roam the wilderness, talk to Ambassador Vartra. That's him over there. And Geralt, I know it's wartime, but try not to be a hero, all right? Just check those leads and come back to me in one piece. Don't worry about coming back in one piece. Uh, do worry waiting. about how long it might take. The Imperial audience. So, with the... Whoa. I mean, an A plus for the teleportation. But I'm afraid I'm going to have to subtract some points for the mess you just made that I am. Am I going to clean that up? Can I clean it up? I might clean some of it up. Just maybe. The Imperial Audience. Geralt had spent years looking for Yennefer, only to have her find him. She had appeared outside the tavern in White Orchards, escorted by Nilfgaardian soldiers. The one-time lovers could not enjoy their reunion, for the sorcerers had insisted they make haste, and for good reason. Geralt and Yennefer had then left White Orchards accompanied by the Nilfgaardians, but only the Witcher and the sorcerers reached for Zima. Along the way, their column was attacked by a cavalcade of wraiths. The omen of war, the wild hunt. Geralt's head was abuzz with questions. What had Yen gotten into? How had the wild hunt found them? Why was it looking for them? Why had he been summoned to Vizima? He was to get his answers from none other than the Emperor of Nilfgaard himself, Emir Faram Rhys. The white flame dancing on the graves of his foes, the most powerful man in the known world. And all for the search of Ciri. Wherever the hell she might be. Like, how long has it seriously been since we last seen her? And will the North Guardians hate me for reading She Who Knows? There is a lot of interesting stuff here, and I do want to know. Folks say there were four at first. The mother, She Who Knows, the Lady of the Wood, came here from a faraway land, and since she suffered terribly from loneliness, she made three daughters out of dirt and water. A long, long time ago, the mother was sole ruler of all of Velen. Her daughters brought her the people's request and served as her voice. Each spring, sacrifices of grain, animals and men were made to the Lady of the Wood on her special night. Yet as the years passed, the Lady of the Wood slipped deeper and deeper into madness. Her madness eventually spread over the land. Men took to abandoning their homes and setting out into the bog, where they became food for beasts. Before long, Velen was drowning in blood. The daughters saw their land near in destruction and took it upon themselves to save it. When spring came once more, and with it a night of sacrifices, they killed their mother and buried her in the bog. Her blood watered the oak atop Art Sebrin. And from then on, the tree grew wholesome and hearty fruit for the people. As for the lady's immortal soul, it refused to leave its beloved land, and so the sisters imprisoned it. To this day, it lies trapped beneath the whispering hillock, where it thrashes about in powerless rage. Okay, with stories like these, one always has to wonder, are these mere stories or actual reality? The Royal Lineages of the North Cyrilla Fiona Ellen Rhiannon, born in 1251, heiress to the throne of Sintra, Princess of Brugge and Duchess of Solon, heiress to Innis Art Skellig and Innis Ant Skellig, and Susrein of Atre and Apiara, daughter of Pavetta, see Pavetta Fiona Ellen, and the urchin of 
Erlen Waltz, CME of Emrys, granddaughter of the famous lioness of Sintra, Queen Calanthe, see Calanthe Fiona Rhiannon. A shipwreck occurred during a journey from Sintra to Skellige, which took the lives of the urchin and Pafeta. Cyrilla's further upbringing was then entrusted to her grandmother. In 1260, afraid of the looming Novgardian threat, Queen Calante sent Cyrilla to the court of King Ervil, see Ervil of Verdun, where the heiress of Sintra was to marry the heir to the throne of Verdun, Prince Kistrin, Kistrin of Verdun. Though, although, though allying with Verdun and gaining the aid of the realm's army was at the time Calante's top priority, no marriage ever occurred, and Cyrilla returned to her grandmother's court. In 1262, during the so-called Sintra Massacre, Cyrilla went missing. Okay, so... Uh, this is all that very confusing thing called politics. And is that all the truth? What was in that book? Or is it hiding the truth? Because none of it speaks about Cyrilla or Siri coming to us. Oh, the wild hand. Oh, you guys have got some really interesting pieces here. From farmers and herdsmen, milkmaids to midwives, all the common folk of the continent whisper, sharing tales of a wraithly procession pounding across the sky. The wild hunt they call it. Winds and gales, storms and blizzards arise when it is sighted, and all grows cold. Though the sun shone bright moments before, some remember only the cold from the shock of the encounter, and claim the riders come always in winter. But nay, this is not so. The hunt brings its own eyes. Death and war gallop in its wake, or so the superstition goes. Yet evil enough is the hunt itself. It takes folks captive, youths most often, in the prime of their wilding years, with ten to twenty summers behind them. Then the hunt rushes in and they disappear, only to return long years later with no memory of what passed in the time between. And why? Why, why, what exactly is the wild hunt and what do they want? A sword for witches. We've already read that one, but I will take a copy for it. Maybe I can sell it. And I will take a rusty bread knife. Nobody here needs it after all. A collected verse of Gonzalo de Versio. Never heard that name before, but uh, love. To love is to build a house of cards, or play a game of chess, or Gwent. With one wrong word or ill-thought move, and you must start it all anew. Tide. Whenever I watch the tide recede, cold coils of fear grip around my heart. Will the sea sneak back, calm and sure, in the dark of night as they have before? Or will they stay on distant shores, leaving crushed shells and washed up dreams as memory of serves of yore? No clue. Someone will probably appreciate that. I'm not the right person for it. Apple juice, silver mug, uh, Luna shards, and the last wish. Human life requires three things for its sustenance. Food, drink, and gossip. It is thus no wonder that no matter where I travel, be it ice-bound puffers or evergreen to sun... To saint to sand. Uh, everyone asks me about the passions that bind Geralt and the sorceress Yennefer of Wenkeberg. As a man both cautious and discreet, I refuse to betray their secrets, with one important exception. The history of their first encounter is so extraordinary, so romantic and moving, that it would be a veritable crime to hide its light beneath a bushel basket. Indeed, had I not witnessed these events in person, I would never believe there was room in our grim and dark world for such fantastic marvels. It all began when Geralt and I were feeling a bit peckish and unburdened by heavy coin pouches, decided to fish our supper out of a lake. No bites were to be had, but we did not leave empty handed. My hook snacked quite a lovely little pot. Obliviously to my friend's warnings, I opened it and, in doing so, freed a powerful gin. Without giving it much thought, I set about proclaiming my wishes. Before I could get the three, however, the gin, irritated, I see now in hindsight, uh, being issued demands so soon after waking, began to throttle me. 
Gerald was able to drive him off, but I was left in a sorry state. I acted, the Witcher told me later, as though under the influence of some curse. Clearly, the help of an expert in the magic arcana would be needed. It was a good fortune that Yennefer of Vengerberg happened to be staying in a nearby village. Geralt went, her, uh, went to her to ask she heal his best friend, who happened also to be the brightest star in the Norse poetic firmament. Yeah, we know, Dandelion, we know. Yennefer, however, was more interested in the djinn, which she wanted to trap into magic servitude, more interested than in its victim, and, it should be said, played the witcher like a well-strung mandolin. Yet rather than grow angry at being used in such a calculating manner, he fell white head over muddy boots in love with her. What happened then? Well, I won't go into details. Suffice to say that Yennefer's plans hardly delighted the Jin, and without its cooperation she proved unable to tame it. The sources would surely have met a tragic end and taken all of Rinda along with her, had Geralt not rushed to her rescue. For once, he did not need to draw either of his blades. To send the gin packing, he had but to pronounce the third and final wish. He could have asked for anything, wealth, fame, power, but instead he asked the gin to bind his fate to that of the arrogant yet intriguing sorceress from Vengerberg. Julian Alfred Pankratz, Viscount of Lettenhof, born 1232. Julian Alfred Pankratz Viscount of Lettenhof. That is your name, Dandelion? I prefer Dandelion, but... Um, Award-winning poet, playwright and troubadour, frequent performer at the court of Nidamir Vizimir uh, Ventral. Oh my god, so many names. Uh, and many other nobles and notables. Alumnus of Oxford Academy. Okay, so this is what happened in our past, and... Our fates bound to that of Yennefer? Interesting. Very interesting. And of course the drawings of Siri. Scars healed nicely. Seems so. Uh, meanwhile, there was this too. A letter to Yennefer. Well, Yennefer knows us by now, I hope. She knows we are nosy. I am going to read this. Jennifer, my dear friend, thank you for your letter. Forgive me for not answering your earlier attempt to reach me via megascope. I'm trying to limit my magic communications to the absolute minimum. One never knows who's listening, don't you agree? I'm delighted you have found a position at our gracious Emperor's court and wish you the best of luck in the search for his daughter. Well, his and technically ours in this case. It is good to know that Emir's intentions for her have become more, how shall I put it, mundane. Perhaps in these circumstances an agreement regarding the lodge will prove possible after all. In response to your first question, I can state beyond all doubt that Siri has not appeared anywhere south of the Yaruga. Believe me, I could recognize her magic signature in my sleep. I have not had any contact with Triss for a long time. I only know that things in Novigrad have taken an ill turn. She mentioned something earlier about fleeing to Kovir, but I am afraid that in the current political climate that amounts to an impossible daydream. I hope I will soon be able to join you in Vizima. First, however, I must take care of some unfortunate yet urgent matters in Beauclair. With my fond regards, Vringilla Vigo. P.S. Thank you for the news about Geralt. He always seems to land on his feet, doesn't he? Yeah, we most certainly do. Even more drawings of her? Yeah. Well. Would make a nice wanted poster. Wanted. Alive. Definitely not dead. Two orange, dried fruits and nuts, smoking pipe, and an empty bottle. Is that all? I guess so. But, in the meantime, a portrayal of the elder races. What is a non-human? The answer is simple. As the very name suggests, it is something which resembles, and yet nevertheless is not, a human. Though it walks on two legs, speaks a tongue similar to our own, and dresses in similar attire, it all the same has more in common with base beast than noble man. 
Really? Oh dear god. Dwarfs are like moles. They feel best on the ground and avoid direct sunlight. They like to live in filth, forever smudging themselves in mud and slime. They love everything that can be found within the earth. Rocks, metal, minerals of all shapes and color. Well, so do humans. Humans like minerals and all the fancy stuff. I mean, rubies, emeralds. It is also said that, like their kindred moles, they feed most readily on worms, roaches, and other night crawlers. Have you asked them? Because it is also said that. Sounds like you never bothered to ask them. Which sounds an awful lot like racism. Halflings, for their part, are more reminiscent of gophers. Fat, lazy, and loud in that typical rodent way. You know what? This is all entirely just... Bigotry to the maximum. Uh, fat, lazy, and loud in their typical rodent way, their minds are filled only with thoughts of food and drink, which they steal from other nobler beasts and greedily squirrel away in their hovels. They are marked by a cruel craftiness. You could be dying of hunger and they would not share a meal with you. You could be howling from poverty and they could be swimming in gold, and yet they would still fleece you to the last crown. You could do nothing but good to them, and they would still stab a knife in your back. Elves in turn seem related to the birds of prey that dwell in far off Zerikania. They care most for colored feathers. They would most readily spend all day staring at their reflections in the water and singing their own praises. They are so awash in self-love that they no longer feel any desire towards members of the opposite sex of their own species. Their appearance, unquestionably pleasant to the eye, is highly misleading, for they are extraordinarily cruel and any who judge them by their looks alone, they first dupe and then kill in cold blood. The best proof of this? The so-called Skoyatal, bandits that claim to fight for freedom but in truth only long to kill humans. <sighs> this book is just... Ah. Just no, just no. All these so vile, or all these vile so called elder races are, to our great fortune, slowly dying out. Joy fills the heart of every right thinking man at the thought that his great grandchildren will never know them, that their day, dwarfs, halflings, and elves will be mere fairy tale characters used to scare young, impressionable children. Already you're trying to do a, a horrible job at that. God. A shame I have no time. Does everyone here have no time? Because I have more than enough time. Smoking pipe, dried fruit. Uh, but no, it's a typical case of don't believe all the stories, decide for yourself and judge someone for their actions. Their very own actions and not for that of their friends. Horse hide, again stuffed in a bucket of some kind. Again, I'll take it, I can sell it. You guys certainly don't need it because everything here is a mess. Bread and smoking pipe. Do you have any more interesting books that I can read? What shall we go to Maria? Did we read that? I don't think we did. Uh, what do you mean I cannot do that right now? Can't I look in my inventory? And I'm afraid I'm going to have to read that one later because I can't access it anymore. Royal Lynch of the North. We did. Did we read that one? No, we did not. Oh. I can. Okay, what shall we come of Tamaria? Uh, Tamaria, a land where milk and honey once flowed. And what did she wrong the gods that they should treat her so cruelly? The Pearl of the North to some, she proved a galloping range for Nilfgaardian cavalry to others. As a country, it had survived two previous wars against the Empire. It was here that the war's bloodiest battles were fought. It was in Tamaria where their most bestial deeds were wrought. It was Tamerian civil civilians who bore the full brunt of these war's horrors. And bear them they did bear them we did, bravely and steadfastly, until the demise of our great protector, King Foltest. Then Providence turned its fickle fate from Tamaria. Murdered from most treacherously, Foltest failed to leave Tamaria a worthy successor. And so all manner of curse soon fell upon her, tearing her apart like so much carrion. She had no more allies then. None remembered that we had once been the armor protecting the north from the designs of the mad dancer. He who had the gravestones of his foes pounded into a ballroom floor. A free and independent Maria is no more. 
A dark-faced sun looms over her every rampart. Yet sweet Marians live on, and always will. As long as folk believe the usurper who took our beloved capital, Vizima, to treat as his property will forever peer over his shoulder in fear. For in the shadows lurks not one dagger, but the power of a nation of daggers, waiting to deal justice's blow. And over here, my attention is mostly brought towards the mad dancer, he who had the gravestones of his foes pounded into a ballroom floor. Is that the name that's given to MFR and Reese? He who dances, the white flame dancing upon the graves of his foes? Because that's grim. Oh boy. And meanwhile, royal lineages of the north. Uh, this one we did read? Yeah, this one we did read. Why it shows up again, I do not know, but it's mine. Okay, which only leaves one further thing to know. I've got some questions for you, Ambassador Far at Trey, because apparently a lot has happened since our last adventure. Since we left. Uh, what was the name? I honestly can't remember the name of where we were before. Oh dear God. Ambassador Varatra, Yennefer suggested I ask you about current events, the war and so on. Of course. The Emperor's servants should keep no secrets from each other. If you will, let us approach the map. Because you guys have taken some grounds. Uh, okay, so in general, how's the war going? How's the war going? I mean, apart from the fact that Nilfgaard's triumph is imminent. I assume this to be a private conversation. We've no witnesses, so let's dispense with the propaganda, even that shrouded in irony. Hmm. Our offensive was going splendidly until winter came. Edern was in such disarray that we encountered no resistance. We had reached the Pontar before the first snows. Only a weakened Kedwin remained and Radovid's Redania, which had ignored the rest of the North's pleas for help. We thought they'd sue for peace, perhaps even submit to vassalization. We waited for spring, certain of victory. Radovid? Submit? Never. Yes, a vain hope, I agree. Radovid sent no peace envoy, nor did he advance on our positions. Instead, he trudged over the snow-bound Kestrel Mountains and attacked Kedwin. His ally. Oh, wow. Took the Kedweni completely by surprise. King Henselt fought on the front line as always. And that is where he died. Henselt was the dead? The soldiers lost the will to fight. They joined Radovid's ranks. Wow. And so by spring, instead of two weak enemies, we had only one powerful one. Oh, yeah, I can imagine that. Uh, is that a note of admiration I hear? Sounds like it. But what about Kofir? That place is supposedly still safe? I mean, I'm more curious about that one. What about Kavir? Kavir values its neutrality. Enough not to lend its armies, or more importantly, even its coin to either side. Returning to the war, this spring there was a massive battle in the marshes of Velen. Massive, yet indecisive. Both sides suffered enormous losses, unprecedented even. Radovid has retreated across the Pontar. He's safe for now, until reinforcements arrive from the south. Then Emperor Emir Var Emrys will deal with him once and for all. Couldn't you just go home? Save everyone a lot of marching, not to mention a few human lives. I'm afraid the stakes are too high to fold now. We can only go all in. Yeah. Okay, so that basically means that all our efforts from before, they've been for nothing. I mean, we got our own little piece for the non-humans at the north of the Pontar. And all of that is just gone. I mean, they were weakened, obviously, because of the whole ordeal with the fight against King Hansel's men, but... Oh dear. And meanwhile, 
Radovitz takes it all. Not happy with that one, especially after what he did to all the mages. He started that whole fight. Ah, oh boy. So, Velen, I'm supposed to go there. What's the current situation? You mentioned war. Hmm. How do things look in Velen? As bad as ever, perhaps worse. Oh, brilliant. This land never flowed with milk and honey, and now it flows with blood. Armies have swept through it several times, trampling fields, looting granaries, burning villages. Famine grips the populace. Mm -hmm. So how's ruling that earthly paradise going for you? Not well, to be honest. Our forces are spread thin as it is. And Velen is chiefly swampy forests that are difficult to control. We've had several patrols never return to their camps. Thus, we've temporarily delegated authority in this region to a certain Nordling. A former low-ranking officer in the Temerian army, one Philip Strenger. Better known by his nom de guerre, the Bloody Baron. Ah. I advise you well. Avoid him. Is he that bad? I mean, you can take the name of Bloody Baron in two ways. He's the Bloody Baron and he's responsible for a lot of bloodshed. Or, how oh dear god, it's that Bloody Baron again. So meanwhile, Novigrad, what's new? Any news from Novigrad? Is the free city still free? Yes, although everyone knows this won't last. Radovid is in Oxenford and the Emperor is here in Vizima. At Novigrad's doorstep, both. And both require coin and ships. Novigrad can provide these. Which is why the mood in the city is rather, well, on edge. Understandable. Meaning. How do men deal with fear? They seek reassurance and scapegoats. The Church of the Eternal Fire understands this perfectly. Oh, God. And so it promises to improve the lives of its flock by pointing out the guilty. Obviously. Who started the war? Who profits from it? Why, it's obvious. Mages, elves, dwarves, in a word, any and all deviants. I've been stationed in Novigrad for 13 years. First as a consul, then as ambassador. I've seen a great deal. Cruelty, cynicism, greed. But what is happening there now concerns me greatly. Yeah. Doesn't only concern you, but likewise me. Like it was bad enough before. And we did have Saskia actually get her own piece of land and actually be victorious, but if... <sighs> this truly isn't quite literally almost an end to most of the dwarves and elves and all non-humans. At least if this war keeps on going like this... Ah, oh boy. I mean, you still had a place uh, called Dolblathana or something that was in hands of Nilfgaard where there was some kind of paradise for elves, but not everyone seemed to agree with that, but... Ah, oh boy. Anyway, uh, finally, what's the latest from Skellige? And Yennefer is supposedly going there right now. What's new in Skellige? Nothing. The islanders pride themselves on that, don't they? Doing everything according to tradition, as their forefathers did. And like their forefathers, they quarrel with each other. Pillage. Occasionally attack our transports. This is cumbersome, but nothing more. Skellige has always been a footnote to history, and so it shall remain. Until the day Sounds they awfully confident. What if King Bran manages to unite the Jarls? Lead all the clans against your fleet? King Bran is a feeble old man. From what I know, he barely remembers the names of his own vassals. Uniting all might prove difficult. But not impossible. And with all that kind of stuff, you never know. Defeat might come from a tiny little corner. Anyway, thanks for your help. It's still quite confusing, but knowing that Radovid is kind of in control of all, a lot of the north right now, yeah, that is good to know. Thanks for your help. Think nothing of it. May the great sun light your path. If you say so, 
Excuse me? Sorry. Oh. That's all nice and dandy. And meanwhile, it seems we've also got some new information on a few more characters. Some who are rather interesting. Starting with Emir for Emrys. Few names in the continent's history arouse as much terror and respect as that of Emir Var Emrys, Deathwind Adan Yinkarp Ip Morvund, the white flame dancing on the graves of his foes, Emperor of Nilfgaard, Lord of Metina, Ebbing and Gemera, Sovereign of Nazir and Vicavaro, he was ruler of half the civilized world and aspiring conqueror of the other half. He was a personage whose deeds and decisions shaped the fates of whole kingdoms and populations. What then could he possibly want of a simple witcher? The emperor clearly and succinctly laid out what he wanted. His daughter and Geralt's ward, Cyrilla, was in great danger, for the wild hunt was on her trail. Geralt, a superb tracker linked to Emir's daughter by the iron bonds of destiny, stood a better chance at finding her than anyone else in the world. And to do so, we need to go to Velen to search for this Hendrik person. Considering the way spy corps of all stripes tend to function, Hendrik was undoubtedly not this man's real name. Nevertheless, that was the only appellation the Witcher knew for his Imperial Majesty's nose to the ground in Velen. After asking around, Geralt learned a Hendrik lived in the village of Heatherton. Okay. And this Morvran Voorhees, not entirely sure what I need to think of him, but... Eh. Morvran Voorhees, commander of the Alba Division, an officer of the highest rank and a pure-blooded aristocrat. One who, with pride, could call himself an elf guardian. A designation reserved only for native-born inhabitants of the Empire's capital and its immediate surroundings. At the time of their first meeting, Geralt had no idea what an important person had been assigned the task of asking him a few routine questions. Knowing the Witcher, however, knowledge of Morfren's rank and status would not have made much of a difference. And lastly, Triss Marigold. I always considered it a point of particular pride to count Triss Marigold of Maribor among my closest and dearest friends. This exceptionally talented sorceress was a shining star of her profession, a former mage advisor to King Foltest and a famous hero of the Battle of Sodden, known as the 14th on the Hill. Yet in no way did she resemble her often unbearably haughty sisters in magic. Her deft mind, warm smile and considerable personal charm had always won over even the hardest of hearts. Though my personal relations with Triss never ventured beyond the fraternal. Geralt of Rivia at one point found her allure irresistible. From then on, the two shared feelings that ran far deeper than a superficial and fleeting fancy. Yennefer told Geralt that Triss had recently taken up residence in the free city of Novigrad. And why do I have a feeling that things are going to get an awful, awful case of complicated in regards to Triss Marigold and Yennefer of Engerberg. Like, we've slept with Triss, we've slept with Yennefer, we've lost our memory in the meantime, and... Oh boy. Ah, <sighs> anyway. That means it's time to continue. Where to? Velen it is. Although, to be fair, we did spoke about Novigrad before slightly, and Pearls of the North, Novigrad. I do am curious about that one. No one can claim to have travelled the Northern Realms who has not been to Novigrad. If I were forced to list what during my many meanderings has made the greatest impression on me, it would be precisely this great, and yet at the same time free, city. A metropolis worthy of the Empire. Its only flaw is that the civilization Nilfgaard carries within her has not yet enlightened it. That is why hordes of reactionary cultists of the eternal fire dwell in the midst of its excellent buildings and superb commercial infrastructure. One feels as though superstition is how the local hierarchy and his temple guards cement their power over the city dwellers. And many they are to control, for the city counts no less than 30,000 of inhabitants. While strolling through its fabulous ports, surrounded by marvels of architecture, 
It is hard to imagine that centuries ago, Novigrad was a mere minor elven townstead. When the city fell into the hands of the Nordlings, its problems grew exponentially. For, as is well known, the people of the North can do a great many things, but peaceful and orderly cohabitation is not one of them. And so Novgorod first belonged to Redania, and then fell under Temerian rule, until finally, after endless compromises and bargains, it at last became a free city. But is the city truly free? I dare to doubt it. Redanian influence makes itself felt too strongly on every street corner, and the fact that the city is located within Radovid's territory speaks for itself. While wandering the city streets, I came across four water mills, eight banks and nearly 19 pawn shops. There are also a great many houses of simple pleasures such as taverns and brothels, and Novograd's commitment to matters of faith is borne witness to by the fact that the city contains no less than, I kid you not, 19 temples to the eternal fire. Uh, what more can be said? I think Novograd has all the markings, uh, all the makings of the capital of the world, and perhaps that is what it will one day become. First, however, someone needs to bring order to within her walls. And now, honestly, I'm really curious. Do we get to see that place? Like, it's showing on our world map. The Skellige Isles show on our world map. The Duchy of Toussaint shows on a world map. We have got a lot of exploring to do in the future. That is a certainty. Now, if I saw things correctly, there also was an update to our information regarding Siri or Cirilla. And dear God, does she look different from when we last saw her. Indeed, all grown up. Uh, let's see, this is all we read before. Uh, Jennifer made it clear why the Wild Hunt wanted Ciri. Eredin wanted the power latent in her elder blood. She also let Geralt know that Ciri had been seen in war, ravaged Tavellan, as well as in Novigrad, the largest city in the world. Okay, Eredin? Can't say I've heard that name before, but uh, still problematic for sure. Now, just one final check, because I want to make sure that I get everything that I can possibly get my hands on. Like this, for example. A sword for... I have way too many books regarding a sword for witches, and I don't mind. Who cavalry boots, timber, killer will? I mean, I'll take it. Hunter Gauntlets, Empty Bubble, and Alchemist Powder. Yeah, it's a good thing I took one final look around here. And I got everything in this room, right? Right. Um. Okay, guess not. Well, in that case, uh, I think we have wandered around for long enough. There's more wandering to do, quite possibly. I need to get my armor back, and after that, it's time that we head off to Velen. How might I serve the gentleman? Armor, now, please. Things. Thanks. Citrus and cloves. The fragrance will keep the gentleman's robes fresh somewhat longer. Mm. Thanks, bunches. The Emperor is not known for his patience. He wants his daughter back safe and sound, as soon as possible. Yeah, mention something of the sword. So long. Something of the sword indeed. And... He knows us, right? We cross the Yara, we will cross In that the case, Yara. he should also know that I like to bloody well take my time. My head is still spinning a bit from all this new information, including the fact that apparently our efforts in Vergen were for naught. But now we at least know what we're dealing with. So let's prepare for our departure, for Velen is awaiting. 